as I say, we've come to um, this really short section, really, in, the, in right in the middle of, of the letter. And it acts as a bit of a, a, bit of a hinge, as a bit of a, a link between the first half of the letter and the second. You see, we've been looking through the first half of the letter, and Paul um, uses the large majority of it to, to provide assurance for the Thessalonians that they are genuinely saved, that they are true, genuine believers, that the gospel that, that Paul and Silas and Timothy shared with them when they were with them was the true one. And, uh, and as, a, as, a, as a small and, and quite a young church, a very young church, Paul used the majority of the first half of the letter to, to encourage them in their faith, to, to say, you're doing the right thing, you're on the right track, keep going, highlighting their faith, hope and love. And then in the second half of the letter, which we will, we will come to over the, uh, the next few months, uh, Paul turns his attention really to, to a few issues in the church that we'll be dealing with and addressing uh, that Timothy had brought back to, to report back to Paul. And, uh, and so we have this link in the, in the middle of the, of the two contrasting halves. And, uh, and this, this link is, is just a prayer. I say just a prayer, it's a prayer to, to the Lord Jesus and God the Father. And it's a prayer that is actually full of exactly the same themes as the whole letter is. It's full of faith, it's full of love, and it's full of hope. So let's take a look together at verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself, and our Lord Jesus. Before we look at the prayer um, in detail, or the content of the prayer, I want to just highlight who it's addressed to. God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus. You see, we see here that, that, that Paul's understanding is that Jesus is God. Lord Jesus. He doesn't simply just go straight to God the Father. He doesn't miss out God the Father and go straight to Jesus. He holds them both as God. He holds God the Father and, and God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as one God, both equal, both God. See, we see here Paul's Trinitarian view, if you want a big word, Paul's view of the Trinity is right here in the letter. And when we go to, to 2 Thessalonians, he, we, we have another prayer in, in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, and he, he, he addresses it exactly the same way, but the other way around. So, Lord Jesus Christ first, in 2.16, and then God the Father. You see, to Paul, the Trinity is true. It's true. This letter, 1 Thessalonians, was written 16, 17 years after Christ had rose and, and ascended back to heaven. So not long, in other words. And the Trinity was right there. The truth of the Trinity was right there from the beginning of the church. It wasn't some afterthought. It wasn't some long thought out idea of over generations and generations where things got changed and, and chopped out and added. The Trinity, God being three persons, all equal, Yet one God was right there from the beginning. God the Father and the Lord Jesus. But look a little bit closer at the first half of verse 11. What else do we see? Let me read it again to you. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus. There's something else that's worth noting. Again in verse 13 we have the same pattern. He says, our God and Father and our Lord Jesus. This isn't a prayer to a distant, uncaring God. It's a prayer, as Paul puts it, to, to our God, our Lord Jesus. You see, a relationship has been established. Paul isn't just praying to, to God. He's praying to his God, his Father. And it's not just his own Father, is it? 
he says our, so he's talking, he's writing to the Thessalonians. And again, more it's more language really that the Thessalonians are saying. It's our from the Father. It brings more assurance for them that they are truly saved. Paul's God is no different to their God. Not just God, but Father. Remember how Jesus started his prayer when he was teaching the disciples how to pray? Our Father. Our Father. Not just God or God in heaven. It's not just God the Father. It's, it's our Father. You know, often people can see God as some distant, maybe authoritative, but distant, uncaring figure. But that's not the God of the Bible, is it? It's not the God of the Bible. Two things to note. That God is a relational God. The God who cares and loves, just like a father loves. And secondly, the Bible teaches that he's our God. He's our Father. Our Father. But that implies that he's not everybody's Father. See, Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples how to pray, he was teaching people who, who believed in him, who trusted in him. Paul used the phrase here for himself, to say our Father, and also for the Thessalonians, who again trusted in Christ. And as Christians today, of course, we can use the same language, can we? Our Father. Because as people who have trusted in Christ, we are adopted into his family, we become his sons. And he becomes our Father. But sadly, that's not true for all people. Not all people can truly say, truly call God our Father, or my Father. So my question this morning is, can you? Can you call God your Father? Have you been adopted as his son? Have you trusted in Christ? <laughs> Becoming a Christian isn't just some religious badge, or it isn't some um, tick in a, in a box on a form. It means that we're adopted into God's family, the creator God of the universe. And we can call him Father. Just like a child can call out to their father. Recently Noah has, uh, has been waking once or twice in the night. And, uh, and when he wakes, he's got into this habit of, of not just crying you know, or saying some mumbled half asleep words, which I sometimes do when I wake up in the night, but at the top of his voice he'll shout, Daddy! Or, or Mummy. And he will do it whether it's 8 pm when he's just gone down or, or 4 am. He will shout at the top of his voice. I'm not sure what the neighbours think, but, uh, but, he, but he does it. And I'm not thinking this at 4 pm, 4 am, sorry, to be honest, but it is nice to know that he's, he has the confidence of shouting for Daddy and knowing that, that we'll hear it and that we'll act on that. To be fair, it's that loud that we don't have an option but to hear him. But, um, but you know, he has the confidence of saying daddy. And you know, we, have, we can have the exact same confidence, in fact more confidence, <coughs> when we call out to our father. He listens. <coughs> That's what Christ has done. It's all powerful, all knowing God the Father <coughs> listens to our prayer. And we see that exactly here. That's what Paul is doing. He's calling out to his father. In verse 10, we see that he, uh, he finishes that section, verse 10, by saying that he would love to see them, to be able to supply what is lacking in their faith. He would love to be able to go to the, the Thessalonica to see these people, to supply what is lacking. And then immediately goes into this prayer calling out to his father. So let's have a look at the, the prayer together. There's, there's, there's three petitions, there's three requests from Paul that I want to pick up on. And the first is in verse 11, and he says, Our Lord Jesus, direct our way to you. May the Lord Jesus direct our way to you. We, uh, we picked up when we were in chapter 2 that Paul has attempted to, to go and see the, the Thessalonians many times. 
He, he tried, he planned to go and, and make the journey to them. But we read that, that Satan always hindered it. He could never get it. And here we see him turn to his father and acknowledge he's completely sovereign and say, please direct our path, direct our way to be able to go and see them, to supply what is lacking. The word direct there is this, this idea of, of making straight, make, making his path straight or making it level, making it an easy journey with no obstacle. I remember some years ago, I, uh, I used to go to, to part of my job, I went to a customer at the top of Dent, you know, a dentist, above Barbon, and, uh, and it was a bit of a drive, and when you got there, it was a, it was a farm on top of a hill, and, and, and it was quite a steep <coughs> hill, and the, and the farm lane would weave up, up the side of this, this field uh, until you got to the top, but it was very rough. A really rough lane, the middle was really high, so you have to be careful in your van, but at the same time you have to, to keep momentum because if you stopped you would just never get going again. And I can remember it vividly. And it was harder really to, to get to the house than to do the job itself sometimes. But then one day I went, um, maybe a few years after I'd been the first time, and I'd done away with them with the, with the lane. And they'd, uh, they'd dug and they lane right through the middle of the field, just vertically up this field. And it was, it was perfectly smooth. Concrete had gone down from the gate on the other side of the road to, to the farm. It was perfectly smooth. I, I couldn't believe it. It was, uh, it was quite a transformation. All the rough areas had gone, all the corners had gone. All the high bits in the middle, all the obstacles had gone and it was made, made straightforward. And that is what Paul is asking of, of his father God. Please, Lord, a way which seems impossible at the moment. I've tried so many times. Please make my path, make my way straight. We read of Timothy's report back in uh, uh, chapter 3, the, the passage before ours. Timothy went to see them, actually, and, and he brought back a report that, of how they were getting on. And it filled Paul with great delight and great joy. Because they were standing firm in their faith. They believed the true gospel. They were continuing in Christ. But they were still lacking a few things, as we read in verse 10. They were still lacking a few things, and Paul would love to go and deal with it. And it wasn't so much their, their knowledge of their faith, if you will. It wasn't so much the knowledge of being saved that they were lacking. They, they were saved. They, were, they had faith in Christ. But they were starting to be a bit complacent, as we go on in chapter 4 we'll find out. A bit complacent with their, their behaviour, a few things were creeping in that ought not to be. And, uh, and Paul urgently, urgently wants to go and help them to live consistently with their faith. To teach them how their faith ought to, to mould and shape the way that they live living consistently in their faith. And that, that could be a challenge for us at times. Well, the Thessalonians found that definitely to be true. And I wonder what dangers we have in our lives of not living consistently with our faith. When you buy a house, more often than not, you, uh, you would get a, a survey done, wouldn't you, to make sure that there was no cracks in the render or or that the woodwork wasn't rotten and your roof was about to fall in. And I wonder if Paul was to do a survey on our lives, I wonder what he would find. Where were we lacking? Where am I lacking? <coughs> what areas of our life are we not applying God's word to and are letting things slip a little bit? I don't often uh, recommend books, but um, I'm not too much of a natural reader, to be honest, but Jerry Bridges is a Christian author, and he writes a book called Respectable Sins. Respectable Sins. And it's all about sins that we tend to, to tolerate or accept in our, in our culture, in our life. Maybe subtle sins that sort of just go unnoticed. Maybe pride or, or, or anger or jealousy. 
Maybe we don't even notice them in ourselves, never mind others. Something we just seem to, to let go and let less live. And amongst other reasons, I think that's one reason why we will be having um, some pastoral groups set up. Making it less likely for, for people to get missed. And giving more opportunity, more focus to be able to be accountable to each other, to be able to encourage each other, ask each other, how do you help? Living consistently with our faith. Paul's next request comes in verse 12. And he says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Verse 12, overflowing love. Overflowing love. We've already seen in the letter that the Thessalonians were a loving community. Paul thanks God for them in, in chapter 1. Of their labour of love, he calls it. And then again in, in chapter 3 and verse 6, Timothy came back and, and he reported that they, they, were, they were faithful and that they were loving. But here we see Paul asked God that they would increase and abound in love amongst themselves in the church and for all people. Paul is praying and he asks them to abound in love. We'd be glad to know that that love isn't some gushy romantic type of love. Not what Paul means. In fact, it's a love that without God, no human would ever experience. No human would ever be capable of giving. It's not even our love for God. It's the love that John writes about actually in, in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4 verse 10 it says, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his love to be a propitiation for our sins. The Greek word for that kind of love is agape. I think I'm pronouncing it right, agape. <coughs> it's the love that God showed us that while we were still sinners, as we thought about earlier, Christ died for us. While he saw all our unworthiness, all our sinfulness, all our uncleanness, all our dirty rags, he still loved and died for us. He still sent his son to deal with the wrath that was brought about by our rebellion. And by Jesus, no human ever born has the capacity to love like that. He loves because it's in his nature to love. He doesn't love for any, any self-gain, any selfish reason, but purely to bless others. And this sort of love, this agape love, results in action. It will always result in action. It will always result in a change in our life. And the very pinnacle action that we see is seen at the cross. The love that God had for sinners most vividly seen and intensely seen at the cross. This is the Garpe love. And it's this love that Paul wants to increase and abound in the Thessalonians. When we love Christ, when we, when we trust in him, we become a new creation. And as a, a new creation, God grants us and helps us to love in this way. On our own, we're incapable. But with Christ, with the Holy Spirit's help, we can love in this way. Not perfectly like Christ yet, but despite seeing people's unworthiness and sinfulness, we can still love. So we can love because he first loved us, as John said. As Christians, as a church, this is where our witness has to begin. It has to start in agape to each other. In love to each other, and in love to all people. Of course, God can, can use, use our shortcomings and our, our feeble efforts to, to do anything. But if our preaching and our evangelism and our witness 
and all the different events that we, we hold or our personal witness in, in individual lives, if that is going to be in any way effective, then it must start by loving each other like Christ loves us. It must start there. So it's likely in, in Paul in verse 12 is asking God to to make this love abound and increase in the Thessalonians because it's linked to a minority in the church in Thessalonica that are, are not serving the church as they should. They're not helping, they're not working together. And again, we'll, we'll come to chapter 4 and see that in more detail, but they're being complacent. But notice, in, in the light of this, what does Paul pray for? If we maybe saw somebody being idle or somebody not willing to, to work or, or serve like they should as, as Christians, I wonder how we would pray for them. Well, Paul prays by saying, increase and abound in love. Lord, produce more, more agape in these people. Give them this God-given love. May it abound, may it overflow more and more, so that they would then use their energy and their, their time to, to serve the church and to those in the church and the those around them in the community. Because this love always produces action. It always results in action. It's a great prayer to pray, isn't it, for each other? And for ourselves. If we see complacency creeping in, why not start by praying for each other that we'd increase and overflow and abound in this love? Remember, when it comes to, to serving in church, we're always in need of workers, aren't we? We're never enough workers. Why don't we start with this prayer? Instead of just praying for workers, which of course is a good and right thing to do. Let's focus our prayers on, on asking the Lord that we'd increase and abound in love. And as that love increases, it will encourage us, it will compel us to serve. And as we and as we love in this way to other people around us outside church, it will perfectly hopefully make them ask questions. And then more workers will be built up. It always results in action. When we're full of this love, we'll joyfully strive to do what we can for each other. Love each other and love those outside the church so that they cannot ignore. Paul knew he couldn't um, preach one thing and act another. And so he tells the Thessalonians, remember what we were like. In verse 12, as we do for you. It's always a danger, isn't it, for the preacher to, to draw attention to himself, particularly in a, in a positive way, where you can be afraid, uh, accused of uh, bragging or, or boasting of your actions, but by no means is that what Paul is trying to do here. Instead, he's pointing out that he's, he's practicing what he's preaching. He's doing what other people ought to do. As we do for you, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they, they risked their life to go and share the gospel in Thessalonica. They never stopped praying. They never ceased to, to stop to, to, to pray for these people. And then Timothy went back to see how they were getting on. Again, another way of showing their love for them. The whole actions of overflowing love. They were no hypocrites. Paul wasn't just just writing to them and then not doing what he said. They were no hypocrites. Overflowing love. Verse 13, we come to our third request, third petition. And we see in verse 13 that, that Paul prays for certain hope. Certain hope of the future. Let me read verse 12 and 13. To you, and as I as I read it, we'll see that, that the goal of verse twelve, if you will, the, the goal of overflowing love, 
Christ-like love results to become blameless and holy on the day of the Lord's return. Let me read verse 12 and 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. Throughout this letter, if you were to read the letter from beginning to end, you would, you would pick up on some familiar phrases, some familiar themes that Paul Paul uses. In each mini-section, really, he, he closes it with a reference to the coming of the Lord, the second coming, the, the return of Christ. Let me just list a few. In chapter 1, verse 10, we are to wait for the Lord Jesus, who will deliver us from the coming of And then in 2, 12, we encourage to live in a manner worthy of God, who calls you, into glory. And then 2.16, the wrath has come upon them at last. And then in chapter 4 and 5, we have full sections on, on the day of the Lord, on the return of Christ. And then right at the end in verse 23 of chapter 5, may your spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The whole letter is one to encourage us to, to push on, to endeavour toward that day, being filled with agape and being established blameless in holiness. And you know, them two things really go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Let me focus just for a minute on, on the word blameless. May he establish your heart blameless. Whenever that word comes up in the Old Testament, it is always used to describe the Lord himself. It's had, it has no other use in the Old Testament apart from to describe the holy, perfect Lord himself. Perfectly blameless. Not just in speech or in action or, or thought, but our, our inner whole being, our heart itself, Paul says, should be perfectly blameless. Perfectly holy, just like the Lord is blameless. Surely Paul is not expecting him to, to live perfectly, perfectly holy, perfectly blameless lives. Well, the answer is yes, in one sense. But Paul's prayer isn't asking for them to achieve perfection so that the Lord will then make them blameless. But it's the other way around. So rather, as Christians, as people who trust in Christ, the Lord already sees us as blameless. The Lord already sees us as holy. When we're in Christ, when we, when we trust in him, we receive his blamelessness. We receive his holiness. We receive his righteousness. In terms of our status, we are already blameless. Paul isn't saying that we need to strive for perfection and then we will become blameless on the day of the Lord. Then we will be accepted. He's saying that your status in Christ is perfection. Blameless and holy. So in other words, be, be who you are, be your status, live up to the status that you already have. And Paul's prayer is that our practice would, would match that status. How do we do that? We go back to verse 12, increase and abound in love that results in action. Our status is already a holy saint. It's already become like Christ if we trust in him. And when we recognise that, we see how today's actions and thoughts and, and practices should be moulded and shaped by that. <coughs> if we live, we should reflect our status. And not only will it change our day-to-day our -day life, but it will change the way we see the future as well. We will have a certain hope of the future. 
not hope in, 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 in this world, but a short hope. Because our status is already there, it's already blameless before Christ. Paul has written this prayer to encourage the Thessalonians, and us, of course, as we, as we look towards Christ's return. And as we're encouraged to, to look towards his return, we'll see our status is already there, and so we should align our life with it. As Christians, we, we shouldn't be guilty of just dwindling our way through life, just letting one day pass by the next, just living life with no real meaning or, or purpose. We shouldn't just let life dwindle away. But you see, this love that should abound in us, increase and overflow, it should compel us into action. We fill our life with a gap in the light of our status and it will change the way that we live. It will result in the fruit of the Spirit. This prayer is designed and there to encourage us. But not just an encouragement, it's, it's more like a, like a come on. Like, like, like a crowd would, would cheer his team on. Let's strive. Let's do all we can to be more Christ-like each day. To serve well. To serve joyfully. To remember what our status is. Of consistent faith. Of overflowing love and focus on the certain hope that we have in Christ. Let's pray together. Now, Father, we thank you, first of all, that we can call you Father. We thank you that through Christ we can, we can come to you in confidence and call out to you. Father, help our lives to increase and abound in your love. Help us, Lord, to, to live consistently with your word. Help us, Lord, to be accountable to one another, to encourage one another, to not be complacent. Help us, Lord, to, to remember our blameless status in Christ as we look towards the future. In Jesus' name. Amen.